Good morning. As I've been studying the Bible for most of my adult life, in fact, I can even go back to most of my childhood and teenage years, one of the things that's difficult at times is to bring into account the history of when statements were made. So in the Old Testament, you might have statements like, if anyone would want to put their child to death, he must go before the city council of elders. And now you go, whoa, that's pretty crazy. But you need to understand at that time, there was no protection for children. Parent could kill their child for anything. To keep the rest in line. I've got 12 more, I'm going to kill this one. Put the fear of dad in them. Now you, we can think of it as a joke, but the reality is true. So when that law came into being, it was actually to protect the children. Now you could go, well, they could go and do it anyway. They just had to get all those men on their side. In all the archaeological studies and all the history that we have, we never once have that law being enacted and carried out, where children were brought before a city, uh, the city elders, and they voted to put that child to death. Not once. There are a lot of things like that. There are things like a man marrying outside of the nation of Israel. He's not supposed to. A woman marrying outside of the, the, the family of Israel, the nation of Israel. A Jew is to marry a Jew. And we kind of look at that and go, well, isn't that inbreeding? But you need to understand at that time there was over 2, 3 million Jews when these were given. And so there was enough in the uh, DNA gene pool to uh, be able to do that. So when you look at, at certain passages in the Old Testament, or even the New Testament, you need to have a proper context. You need to understand when they were written, why they were written, who they were written for, and for the purpose. Here's one that's kind of difficult, that if you miss it, you could miss some of the richness of the New Testament. No one born of a forbidden marriage, nor of any of his descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, even down to the tenth generation, Deuteronomy 23, 2. So what's a forbidden marriage? Well, it's not even marriage, it's a forbidden union. That could be, oh, let's, like David and Bathsheba. They had a child out of a forbidden union. His name was Solomon. Well, who else is a forbidden union? Well, any... Any ch uh, child conceived or born out of wedlock was a forbidden union. So if your great, 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 great grandparents uh, were not married and your great, 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 great grandfather was born, you still would not be permitted into the holy assembly. You'd be on the outside. You'd be an unwanted or unwelcomed member of the Jewish nation. And so it was very important to have these genealogies for that reason. But even Jesus, when he came, he came and was conceived in a virgin, pledged to be married. Not married, pledged to be married. So what does that mean? This rule must have been given for some reason. Well, it was. It was given to bring holiness to marriage, to guard yourself. But the problem then became they held to the rule more than the people. So if there was rape, if there was incest, if there was a molesting, and a child came about from that, not only was the woman put out, but all of the children came out of that. And it really protected those that committed the crime. Jesus addressed this. He, said, he would say things like this. You've heard it said, but I tell you. Why? Because rules would be made so they didn't break rules. So if they had a cars in those times, they would have a fight to see who could be holier about not breaking the speed limit. So the speed limit's 70 miles an hour. One group would say, well, we are going to be holy. We're not going to set it. At 69, we're going to set it at 65 because we don't want to come close to breaking the rule. Another group would go, oh man, that's, that's way too liberal. We're going to set it at 60. 
It's that kind of mentality. Now, let me bring to light some of what Jesus did. In Mark chapter 10, and I'm reading verses 13 through 16, it says this, And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them, bringing children to him. These were the children of those that were not allowed in the assembly. Jesus broke the barriers, and so they brought the children to the teacher who would accept them. And the disciples became indignant is a different place. When you read this in other parts of the uh, Gospels, uh, like Matthew or, or Luke, you might see the word indignant. Why would, they, why would you bring these children, these, these unwelcome to the assembly children, to Jesus? But when Jesus saw it, verse 14, he was indignant with them, the disciples, and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Can you imagine somebody using this as a political tool or for control over other people? Well, I know you're, you're, not, uh, you're not properly born. I know your great-great-grandparents conceived you outside of their marriage or out of wedlock or that you're, you're the bastard son of this person or, and the blame that was placed upon them. See, rather than heeding the fact that marriage was to be pure, was to be honoring God. Why? Because <laughs> there's other places you can search this for yourself. God desires godly offspring. He wanted children that were raised in a loving home, in a home that would teach the things of God. And so they took the negative aspect of the rule and made more rules upon it. I think it's interesting we do the same. You see, no one can keep all the law perfect. No one can go without sinning. And when I say law, I'm talking about the law that Jesus came and fulfilled. But also the law, let's use the Ten Commandments. Do you know what Paul said about the Ten Commandments? Now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone, the ministry of death, the law of death, just like we have in like in English uh, in Great Britain, you would have the ministry of this or the ministry of that. The, they would be carrying out the law. And at the ministry of death, the law of death being worked out, carved in on letters on stone. What letters on stone do we have of, that are law or a ministry of death? Ten Commandments. Nobody can keep those. And so you see how easy it is to sit in judgment and go down and pine for these small things. And go after that and judge everybody else. And yet we give ourselves all these freedoms. In other words, you could say it this way. I'm going to judge others by what they do and myself by my intentions. How very generous of you. How very generous of me. Why? Because we all do this. And so, do we make others less so that we can stand higher? That's a difficult thing even in today's day and age. When we want to bring up all the negative of somebody's past. And people have done horrible things in their past. But God still used them to do great things. Father, help us. Help us not to pass judgment on others that we ourselves couldn't even pass. Help us also, Lord, to know that you are gracious to us and that it's your kindness that brings us to repentance. And so, Lord, allow us to extend your kindness to others, not so that we can get out of them what we want, 
but so that we can love them for who you say they are. And help us be as simple as little children and following not the law, but the relationship with Jesus Christ. Help us to get past rules made by men and be with Jesus today. Amen. I love you. Have a great day. And I'll see you soon.